You're listening to Mind Body Home with your host, Sarah Ann. So I've been getting some feedback on my recent episodes about the Mind Body Home Alignment Program that is open for enrollment coming this Friday, November 1st. And I've been hearing from a lot of you. I've been getting some questions. There's a lot of interest, which is wonderful. And I've also been getting some questions. And so I wanted to address one that keeps coming up uh, here. And that is why an integration of feelings and emotions uh, when we're talking about working with our home environment. And you know, I want to just, I want to answer that here because this, it's even interesting for me because this weekend I had some emotional awareness come up for me uh, living in my new home here. We had a, a mobile barber come to the home yesterday to cut my son's hair, which was great. It's an elevated service. Uh, my son thought it was really cool. He brought his own barber chair and he was, you know, this young guy from New York, you know, it was, he was entertaining. And so it was an actually lovely service. Um, and I was so grateful to have it because I have not yet been able to sit down and figure out where are we getting haircuts, new doctors, new dentists. So having a mobile barber, what a cool idea and such a fantastic service. But The reason I'm bringing that up is I noticed when he came over that feelings of embarrassment and, you know, a little bit of shame were coming up for me. And it took me by surprise at first because, you know, I talk about this stuff all the time, you know, and being an interior designer, going into so many people's homes, those are probably the two emotions that come up the most for clients, especially when first meeting them, that first walkthrough of their space, right? Like, oh, it's such a mess in here. Please don't mind, you know, the mess or don't even look in that room or, you know, I'm going to keep this door closed. We don't need to go in there, right? So it's it's something I'm very aware of. And I was so surprised at myself to hear it coming up and out of me, right? And it just goes to show you that there's always layers to be working on, always layers to be peeling back. And once I recognized it, I started recognizing how I was doing it in other ways as well since moving into this home. So again, we're new to the area and we're renting a home. And, you know, we've only been here like seven weeks. So there's, I'm still kind of trying to figure out the home intuitively. Like, how do I want to use the spaces? And so I have this one room right off the kitchen that has sort of become a little bit of a dumping ground for, you know, books and decor items that I don't know where I want to place them or I don't have somewhere to place them right now, but I want to have them out. And so that's what I was excusing when he came over. It was, oh, don't mind this mess. We just moved in, you know, and I almost lied. Like, we've been here seven weeks, like, you know, I should have it a little bit more together. And again, I'm putting such expectations on myself to be perfect and have it all together. And so that's what I realized was coming up for me in that moment. But in other ways, it's also coming up in the front of our home. So we live in a really nice gated community. Everyone here maintains their lawn and their landscaping. It's very tropical and lush and full. And we have a bunch of dead plants and some old mulch and that's about it and again we're renting so we are obviously not going to put a a, a huge investment into our own landscaping but because we're in an HOA I addressed it with the property manager and said hey you know it's only a matter of time before the HOA is like you got to do something with this yard can we get in front of that and get some new landscaping and they happily accepted the job Um, It's been delayed with the hurricane, so we've just been waiting patiently to get new landscaping, but I also found myself doing that with neighbors and, um, you know, my kids have made some friends, and so I've been meeting some of their parents, and so I found myself saying, I'm the house down the street with the rough landscaping, right, or with very little landscaping, and they're like, oh, I'm not sure which one you're talking about, and it goes to show you again that that's me projecting something out there that people aren't even noticing. People don't even pay attention. And here I am leading with it. And when I lead with it, I'm drawing more attention to the fact 
that I don't have good landscaping. So just interesting to me that it's been coming up with this new home. And what that means to me is there's still some sort of emotional layer between my unconscious behavior leading conversation with shame and embarrassment rather than leading with my conscious desire for a well-dressed home. And so this is one example of how emotions show up in the home. Guilt is actually another emotion that shows up frequently at home, and that's usually tied in with clutter or some sort of layer of inability to let go of things, you know, no matter how big or small. You know, clutter is not hoarding. I want to be very clear about that. Clutter shows up anywhere from the kitchen counter to the bedroom closet to basements and attics and every other nook and cranny or drawer possible. I often say that our home has an intuitive language. In fact, in the Mind Body Home program, this intuitive language is what you begin to understand within your own home and something that I love sharing more about. But that intuitive language is actually our emotional intelligence trying to reach us. In the body, of course, unprocessed emotions show up as chronic pain, illness, and disease, or as the late, great Louise Hay called it, dis-ease. So yes, in the Mind Body Home Alignment Program, we are bringing together Mind Body Home into a more balanced state. And it's almost as if the common denominator between all three of them is our emotional awareness. And again, that's the question that was sort of coming up around the program was how do emotions even play into this? You know, I was listening to last week's episode and I thought it was really insightful, but how does it fit in? And it fits in because it's the common denominator among all of the imbalanced states of mind, body, and home. From childhood, we develop in various ways, right? Physically, intellectually, even artistically. There's there's a few others. But emotionally, our culture hasn't supported or really even acknowledged this type of development until rather recently. And so when emotions aren't acknowledged as a young child, we tend to turn away from our emotions entirely. And this happens, you know, around the age from, I'd say, four to seven. And so that's often the level at which our understanding and development will stay. So as you can imagine, a lot of adults are functioning emotionally at the age of about a five-year-old. And none of us really for generations have been taught about emotions in general, what they are, what they feel like, how to process them, you know, how to even acknowledge their presence. And because we haven't fully developed emotionally, we instead disassociate entirely by distracting ourselves or indulge in addictions, really anything that will replace the uncomfortable feelings that are so foreign to us. Distractions and addictions at home look like, again, clutter, the inability to take any sort of action on cleaning out a closet or a room, constantly having a messy bathroom or a messy kitchen, or there's always laundry on the floor or overflowing the hampers, right? It also looks like overstuffed refrigerators and pantries, purchasing things in bulk when it's not necessary. I've even seen distractions with books and reading. This actually was one of my distractions. And and I guess definitely a book addiction and then reading as a distraction. I found that, you know, even though reading isn't necessarily a bad thing or a bad addiction, but as I became more aware of my tendencies towards distraction was that I would use reading to avoid intimacy with my husband in the evening or Whenever I was feeling overstimulated by the kids, I would retreat to my room and just, you know, say, I'm going to go read a few chapters. You know, there's nothing wrong with books and reading when it's an authentic desire, but recognizing that it can also so quickly become a habit that begins interfering with your relationships because you're simply avoiding feeling something. So the pathway to honoring our feelings and emotions and what we explore in Mind Body Home Alignment is imbalance, understanding, and then resolution. 
we recognize there's an imbalance. We might not have full awareness or even the words to describe it, but we know something is off and we certainly don't know how to fix it. And the reason we don't have the words is because it's an emotional imbalance. We don't understand our emotions. And this is why our mind sabotages us, which I spoke about in last week's episode, to keep us safe or the mind thinks it's keeping us safe because the alternative is the unknown. And that part of your brain would just rather not, okay? It's not your curious, explorative side of you. So it will fight to keep you doing what you've always done because what you've always done is safe. So in working with this intuitive language, this underdeveloped emotional intelligence, we bring understanding to the table. We learn the intuitive language of our home, of our bodies, of our mind. And from that place of understanding, we start stepping into our power and start rebalancing and reframing and living in alignment with our highest and best version of ourselves. This is what I call life design through the lens of home. We start seeing what is possible for us just by bringing a different level of understanding. The one thing I also want to highlight is I want to ensure that as you start uncovering some of your own distractions or maybe addictions, that you don't start shaming yourself because they do serve a purpose. And that purpose is generally comfort. It's really only a natural response to want to soothe uncomfortable feelings and emotions, you know, but once you start bringing them into the light, once you become aware of them, you really can't become unaware because your intuition and your curiosity will start gaining momentum to begin the healing process, right? To begin healing you from the distractions that have become poor unconscious habits and starts transcending them or integrating them into opportunities for learning and growth and really your own self-actualization. You know, one of my favorite lines is, once you know, you can't unknow it. Isn't that amazing? I mean, sure, you can always ignore your intuition and do what you want anyways. There is free will, but really, once you know, you can't unknow it. You can ignore it for a short period of time, but it's always going to be there pushing you forward. The awareness just doesn't go away. You're going to be reminded and you're going to be aware of why you're being reminded. And that's your intuition. That's your intuition calling to you to keep pushing you forward into the life that you want, into the better version of yourself that you desire. And this is a huge part of mind-body-home alignment. We create safe space for your emotions to come up, to be seen, to be heard, and we just listen to them, right? We use the intuitive voice of your emotions. That intuitive language of your emotions is calling to you from your home, from the chronic pain living in your body. Your emotions speak intuitively. Your emotions are the bridge between your unconscious behaviors and your conscious life. This is why we've never been taught or why we never understood them because an intuitive language is something that's very new to our modern culture. It's just now really becoming very mainstream, but it's still very foreign to so many. And so I want to guide you in that I want to bring you closer to your intuitive language, the way it speaks to you, the way it's calling to you, the way it has been calling to you, and the way your mind has been avoiding listening to it. So in order to help you understand why we've been shortchanged in our emotional development, I'm going to end today's episode with a short excerpt from the book, The Language of Emotions, by Carla McLaren, who's work I am just absolutely fascinated by right now. I'm digging into so much of what she's putting out there. And actually, a lot of her work is really even old, but I just love it so much. I've kind of been geeking out on emotions for the last several months. But I want to use this short excerpt to just ensure that you don't, again, fall into that cycle of shame and embarrassment of not only your home, but of, of how you've been distracting yourself from feeling 
your emotions or engaging in some of the addictions that maybe you do because it's okay, right? You did what you needed to do to comfort yourself. It's only natural to self-soothe. So here is just a very short excerpt from the book, The Language of Emotions. My distractions don't make me more capable or more aware. They just take me out of commission for a while. Though I may experience a sad sense of fun in my distraction of choice, the discomfort remains, my resistance increases, my emotional agility decreases, and my suffering is certain. It's as if I'm placating an upset baby with toys rather than helping it learn and grow. So let's look at a real life experience with a baby who won't stop crying no matter what we do. It's hard to be there with all that noise and unhappiness. We make soothing sounds and try to alleviate the distress. We check for binding clothes, wet diapers, hunger, or thirst, but the crying increases with the baby's frustration. We shush the baby, we rock her, but she keeps crying, so we try to make her laugh. We find a toy. We get Mr. Bunny and make him do a dance. Look at Mr. Bunny. My bunny hops on his head. Mr. Bunny's funny. Let's laugh with Mr. Bunny. When the baby begins to laugh, we feel better. Whatever was bothering the baby, well, that's forgotten now, thank goodness. We have peace. And that's what matters, right? However, what if we could say to the baby, you feel really sad. I know, things are hard right now. Usually, the baby will stop crying much faster if we just let her feel, if we just support her in the way she feels at that moment. I've found that even very young babies, if you support their feelings, will be able to calm themselves or make some movement toward the source of their problem. Crying can move discomfort into conscious awareness, even in young babies. And from that place of awareness, even young babies can communicate their true needs. If we get in the way with jostling and distractions, the crying will probably stop, but the baby will have missed an important growth experience. She won't have been able to let her feelings tell her what's wrong and she won't have been able to make a conscious connection between her discomfort and an important issue inside her. What's worse, we won't have helped her strengthen her connection to her own water element, which means we'll move further from our own water element as well. When we wave Mr. Bunny around, we stifle awareness in others, but we also dim our own awareness and become less able to deal with life as it is. Unfortunately, that's how we've set up our lives and our culture. If there's trouble or pain somewhere, we rarely sit with it and honor its truth. We rarely support the emotions or follow them from imbalance to understanding to resolution. Instead, we bring out some form of Mr. Bunny and terminate our discomfort. But in doing so, we multiply it into suffering that hurls us right out of our psyches. We don't honor the discomfort or the trouble. We just distract the baby inside. We learn this in culture from our earliest moments, that discomfort must not be allowed to run its course or inform us in any way, that anything is better than discomfort. Young or old, rich or poor, we all rely on distraction and avoidance as a matter of course. It's the defining movement in our training and in our culture. So my takeaway for you in reading that is to not shame yourself for the distractions that you have put before you because you were never set up to succeed emotionally. But if you're ready to unveil your emotional underpinnings and see them for what they are and listen to what they want to tell you, I can assure you, you will be on a path to the life you desire by acknowledging them, just like the baby wants to be acknowledged. We don't have to ignore, we don't have to wave a distraction in front of us to not feel it. It's so very much an important part of our self-development and our growth 
And if we really are serious about the transformation, we have to stop ignoring the feelings and the emotions. So I hope that answers the question about why emotions in mind-body home alignment. It really is the common denominator. And it's a big portion of what we're going to expose and work on in the program. Another question that I got was around the start date. So enrollment opens November 1st and a couple of people had reached out asking, why are you starting in November? It's so busy. I want to join this program, but it's like right before the holidays. And let me tell you something. If you're going to be triggered emotionally, it's going to be around the holidays. And I personally feel like there is such added stress during the holiday season, financial stress, relationship stress, right? Like you're, you're visiting with families, possibly undesirable family members, right? Um, it can bring up a lot of sadness for some who maybe don't have family. Um, so the emotional triggers during the holidays are increased. And so I want to support you through that. And I think that it's a really wonderful opportunity actually to kind of meet this head on. And I, the other thing is we enter the water phase during these months and the water phase is that season of winter and it's about going deep into those watery emotions. And so I wanted to use the natural cycle of the seasons to support us during our 12 weeks together. And it actually brings us right up into the Lunar New Year, which is the very beginning of February. And, you know, I personally resonate with the Lunar New Year or the Chinese New Year, um, not because I'm a feng shui instructor, but because I naturally am ready to start much later into January, early February. I've never been one that has been like, January 1st is here. Let's go. That's not me. I've always sort of needed this like recovery phase in January. Um, I like to leave the tree up a little longer. I like to still sort of sit in the quiet comforts of home through January. Uh, so if, if you're like that, this program will support you through that too. And, you know, again, that winter season is about going deep and it's a lovely time to incorporate new ways of being and living. And so we can set you up for the spring and that wood element so that you can feel that sense of rebirthing, right? Because once you learn some of these, you're going to almost feel like a, a completely different person. Um, you're going to have so much more awareness about yourself. And listen, this work is never done, okay? This work is never done, but the program is going to give you a huge leg up on how to take life as it comes, because when you have the tools in your toolkit, you know what to utilize when life sort of comes at you unexpectedly. But you also have the tools and techniques to create the life you want by, by living life by design. So join me in Mind Body Home Alignment. Again, enrollment opens November 1st. Emails will be going out later this week with further information, what to expect, and cost and all of that juicy information. So the link to sign up to get on that email list is in the show notes. I look forward to meeting you in the program. Until next week, my friends, I'm sending you so much love and gratitude.